My name is David Orban, and you are very, very welcome to connect on LinkedIn or follow me on Twitter uh, or uh, send me an email. Uh, I'm extremely easy to Google, and I like to uh, continue the conversations that the opportunity of these talks uh, uh, represents beyond the few hours that uh, we will spend together. In my various roles at Singularity University, uh, at the London-based Global Nonprofit Network Society Research, or uh, the recently uh, launched firm, a VC firm, Network Society uh, Ventures, uh, I have the privilege of really collecting the thoughts uh, that I uh, recently published uh, in, uh, uh, in a book form uh, edited in various languages. Uh, you can download the book for free uh, at the URL that you see on, on the screen, and um, I hope that uh, you will enjoy it or you will give me some feedback, uh, critical or, or uh, just praising it, uh, depending on, on what, you, what you feel. I really believe that technology uh, shaped humanity. We um, discovered fire and started digesting the food with the help of fire so that our brains could grow to the size we uh, are at today um, without having to spend all the day foraging like our cousins, uh, apes, uh, have to do. Um, and we have been building uh, what has become a, a wonderful global civilization by making sure that we were not like the dinosaurs who didn't have telescopes. And the question is, are we able to keep evolving the technologies, but also the methodologies that helped us uh, come to where we are today? Alchemists were explorers of the universe just as we are, but they were doing it in secret. And any mortal mistake that an alchemist would do couldn't be avoided by the others because they kept it uh, from each other without openly communicating. And that is an important lesson. Openness, transparency, communication, trustworthiness are the foundations of this virtuous cycle that science and reason have enabled us to uh, rely on as we build our uh, global civilization. And this project started a long time ago. Uh, the Egyptians were not lesser scientists as they were able to understand, design, engineer, organize, and realize incredible achievements. And we are very similar to them. We are very similar as people. Uh, we are not superior. Uh, if uh, you went and asked an Egyptian slave, uh, is your condition just? He wouldn't say that it was just because that was the condition that was natural at the time to be in slavery for uh, a large number of people. He would say, no, I'm suffering as hell. But then if you ask the follow-on question, can you imagine a society that is not based on slavery? He would laugh and he would say, obviously it's impossible. Look at that boulder. I was told to move it over there. Somebody has to do it. If I refuse, I will be killed and the next guy will have to move it, but the boulder got to be moved. And today we are living in a society that has been able to understand that slavery is not necessary. But if we are the same people, if we are the same humans, if our moral understanding of what is just and not just is the same, the difference is actually constituted by technology. Our moral ambition itself is empowered by technology, making the impossible possible. And there's another example it has only been 100 years or so, maybe 150, that we came to the shared realization that it wasn't a great idea to have 10 or 12-year-old children working in mines for hours 
on end or days or years on end. And so these achievements of a few thousand or a few hundred years ago are now still in progress as we are creating an interconnected global civilization with all its varieties, uh, without a homogeneous understanding of what it means to be living a just life with a purpose that creates values and benefit to humanity. And as an example, for too long, we have believed that it was OK to have unsustainable practices. It is only recently that we have started to understand that actually, what a surprise, unsustainability is unsustainable. And the only reason is because the planet is quite small and we ran out of continents to despoil. We cannot discover a new uh, land where we pretend there are no natives, or if, the, if there are, we just kill them and it's all right, and, and we, we exploit the mineral or, or forestry or fishery, whatever natural uh, uh, treasures of that new continent. We, we don't have any more. And as a consequence, we are now much uh, closer to understanding in an intimate level that we need to explore and build new structures that uh, create a net positive effect, not only in terms of economic profits and output, but in terms of their impact in, in society. And the biggest um, obstacle towards understanding and implementing this uh, is represented by our old type of thinking, by the cages within which we uh, put our dreams and our ambitions. Now, I want to spend a few minutes to talk specifically about exponentials. We are living in exponentials. And from a mathematical point of view, they're quite simple. It doesn't matter what the numbers are. It doesn't matter where is the doubling, whether it is every minute, every year, or every thousand years. But if you start with a very weak phenomenon, for a long time it will be building without being recognized. Because it lives in a natural environment that has a lot of noise, that has so many other things going on. And even experts are going to say, well, I am much more comfortable to be uh, looking at the data points that I have and doing a linear interpolation than not believing what you are saying, that this is going to go through the roof, because I just can't. This is a very human, very natural reaction. And actually, to make things even worse, at the beginning, a linear interpolation uh, tends to give a more optimistic outcome. So next year's result could be uh, uh, projected at a higher value, if that is the outcome we want, through a linear projection than not an exponential interpolation. And only after a given symbolic threshold, once again the numbers don't matter, the time intervals don't matter, is crossed that it becomes visible to everybody. And everybody jumps on the winning course and says, oh, I knew it all, all, all the time. Uh, we have seen this, and now we have video recordings to, to um, dig out from the archives with the internet. Uh, in the 90s, uh, there were interviews in the middle 90s when people were saying, yeah, this internet thing and the at sign, what it is for, is not going to go uh, very far. And those people were very happy when there was the bump in the road uh, represented by the dot-com crash uh, around the year 2000, a little later, 2001, where they believed, oh yeah, this is just a fad and it's going to go away. 
and we can go back to our usual way of, of doing things. But actually, the companies uh, that were able to overcome that, that blip uh, of, of uh, financial stress that uh, was represented by the dot-com crash uh, have become extremely powerful. And, and even in those years, new ones were born that transformed the way we work and we live. So what powers this uh, in the example of, of IT and computers is, is Moore's Law. Uh, formulated just with, with three, four, five data points with, with, with a belief that is uh, amazing, uh, 50 years ago by Gordon Moore, uh, it uh, is not a natural law. It is a self-fulfilling prophecy where groups of engineers all over the world are working hard to prove it right. And computers have been actually doubling their power uh, and going down in price for even longer than 50 years. When the first computers were born, um, they were deaf and blind. Actually, they didn't even have memory. When we turned them off uh, uh, in the evening, the day after, we had to start from scratch teaching them everything about the universe. They knew nothing. And later, we started to use transistors, integrated circuits, and then we reached a point where we couldn't ignore the quantum mechanical effects that totally um, interfere and, and destroy our assumptions of very fundamental things like what is an insulator, what is a conductor, and we pretended those effects didn't exist, but now we are uh, dealing with feature sizes that are so small that actually the next generation of computers are using those effects to become even more powerful than before, and these are the quantum computers that are starting to be available and are starting to be used for practical uh, tasks as well. And parallel to hardware, of course, we did the same with software. They go hand in hand, they co-evolve. Um, punch cards and then interactive teletypes, these allowed with the coming of the common line interface to uh, broaden the number of people who could use computers. And then, of course, the metaphors for our day-to-day -day things, uh, the desktop metaphor becoming extremely colorful. The revolution of touch was very important because it decoupled the computer from the constraints of the human hand, where keyboard sizes really dictated how small you could usefully make a computer to be. And then with um, gesture recognition, environmental sensors, we now can have and do have computers everywhere in the world where they are with various sensors, more and more numerous sensors are learning about the world all over, accumulating data and getting better at what they do. Getting better in serving us, in assisting us. And now the next generation is conversational interfaces, where the hardware can disappear and we are just having a dialogue with a computer that understands whether we want to set an appointment and when and where and, and how and alerts us when we are in an area where we need to pick up the milk or, or whatever else. And of course, exponentials don't stop. And the next wave is already around the corner where brain-computer interfaces are going to be able to map our emotions, to map our intentions, to anticipate our desires, and to understand people and the universe better and better. Exponentials are not only about computers. Um, very famously, the Human Genome Project started in 1985 and had a budget of $3 billion. Half in the project, seven years after starting, they were at 1% of the total goal. 
only 1%. And even the experts were saying, wow, this is a disaster. We have to stop. We don't have 700 years and $300 billion. This can go nowhere. But that 1% was achieved exponentially. And then the year after, they were at 2%, and 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. And they didn't even have to go to 128. They hit the total project 100% right on time, right on budget. But exponentials didn't stop. And 15 years later again, you don't need 15 years to get a human genome sequenced. It is just a few weeks, and it doesn't cost $3 billion. It costs $1,000. But exponentials don't stop there. And already, the sequencing machines are being built and bought and deployed that will practically guarantee that by 2022, so another seven years from today, we will have an additional human genome sequenced at a cost of about two cents practically in real time. So think about that world because it is not 30 years away. It is right around the corner. What kind of world are you going to be living in where this kind of information that was never available before is going to be available to anybody at practically no cost? These are the things that we are talking about at Singularity University, uh, funded by uh, Google. Uh, our summer course actually is now free, uh, which raised the bar tremendously uh, for the, the talent, the smarts, the passion, the creativity needed to get in at the wonderful uh, and unavoidably exclusive NASA headquarters, uh, where we can have 80 people and not more than 80 people every time we, we, we hold a course. And that is why our global uh, chapters uh, that have started to, to be born, like uh, uh, Singularity University in the Netherlands, uh, are so wonderful, or like the one that uh, uh, has been born recently in, in Milan and in many, many other cities around the world, because they bring this type of thinking, this type of understanding, and this kind of call to action uh, to hopefully uh, millions or billions of people around the world. This is a random image of a rabbit. <laughs> so our civilization has been very successful in building, in transporting, in organizing commerce. And this success came by through the division of labor, uh, through the organization of dependencies, hierarchies, reporting structures. Uh, and whether it was in uh, um, designing and producing a widget or a pyramid, or whether it was financing um, a trip or a ship to the East Indies, this structure, this centralized hierarchical structure, served us very, very well. But today, we are seeing the development of an alternative method of going about our goals. And my thesis is that we are now seeing this development building a very strong foundation from a technological point of view that is going to cause a widespread social and economic phase transition. And actually, this transition is going to happen because the new way, the decentralized way of organizing our goals, production, commerce, communication, defense, everything is superior to the previous uh, way of centrally organizing it. And I also believe that this change is unstoppable in that the 
most prominent representative of the centralized organization, the nation state itself, is going to be uh, disrupted by it. And it is not going to be able to adapt to keep being the most prominent force of social organization uh, on the planet. That is why three years ago I founded uh, Network Society Research, uh, which is a London-based uh, nonprofit. Uh, it has now representatives in uh, over 30 countries around the world. We are very proud and happy to have uh, Yuri as our Netherlands uh, ambassador. And we are studying and publishing uh, research and analysis around what this means and, and give concrete examples around the developments. And we call these pillars of the network society. In energy, for example, it is easy to understand that rather than having a carbon-based or a, an oil or a gas-based plant that costs maybe a billion dollars and 10 years to build and a 20 years ROI, solar photovoltaics allows anybody to make an independent decision whether to put it on a roof or on the building of uh, a given corporation and then within a few months to be able and see uh, how it is shaping up, what is the balance of the investment and the return. And the myriad of these independent decisions can very easily build up uh, to create a profound shift in the energy basis of, uh, uh, of a society. In manufacturing, it was actually uh, one of the fundamental tenets of economics that you needed a proportionally larger amount of capital to be deployed in order to produce more and more complex uh, products uh, in uh, um, plants that, that were more and more expensive. And today we have 3D printers that don't mind to create a, a, a stupid uh, plastic cube or a beautiful complex object. It takes the same effort the same capital, and the difference in value accrues to the creativity of the designer, the person capable of actually coming up with the ideas powering the, the printer. In food production, uh, the paradigm for the past century that successfully created the uh, surplus of uh, food production uh, that moved um, the global population uh, from 2 billion people to 7 billion people we are today and diffused uh, the uh, quite catastrophic uh, projections uh, of the Club of Rome that uh, in the 60s predicted that by the 80s there would be worldwide famine uh, and, and uh, anarchy. Uh, the Green Revolution is now being supplanted by new technologies. Uh, Plant Labs is a Dutch company that uh, allows LED-based production of uh, plant uh, material with a radically reduced consumption of soil, water, uh, and in an environment that doesn't need pesticides that can grow uh, the largest variety of food that, that we need. And in a city like New York, we already have the basement of the skyscrapers occupied by washing machines. So imagine how hard would it be to have another story dedicated uh, to growing the food that is consumed in the same building. And uh, it could be personalized, it would be healthy, it would be practically organic. Another Dutch example uh, is uh, the 3D printing of meat, the cultivation of, of meat. Um, in London in 2013, the first uh, uh, cultivated meat hamburger patty was very ceremoniously uh, eaten and uh, some of our people from Singularity University were there. Uh, it wasn't very good because it only had muscle cells. Uh, the fatty parts uh, are uh, contributing uh, importantly to the flavor uh, of, of the hamburger. 
and it cost, the single patty cost $300,000 to make. <laughs> now, we are three years later, and uh, due to the exponentials that increase the power of output and decrease the cost, uh, the uh, Dutch uh, researcher that created this project announced at a conference in Australia, uh, it was, I think, summer 2015, so actually two years after, that uh, the same uh, process is now yielding um, cultivated meat at a cost of $30 per kilo rather than 300,000. And the projection is that in another couple of years, it will be cost competitive with any other uh, process. And once again, this reduces the consumption of energy, water, soil, and it comes without animal suffering. Vegan associations already confirmed that their members will be able and allowed <coughs> to consume uh, this kind of meat because it doesn't involve animal suffering. And it will allow us, Western chauvinist myopic people, to stop uh, saying to the Chinese and the Indians, oh no, you shouldn't start eating meat because the planet is not enough uh, if, you, if you start for everybody. They will be able to actually uh, use uh, 3D printers uh, to produce a variety of gastronomically excellent creations that are going to surclass what five-star restaurants or Michelin, whatever number of star restaurants uh, are producing today. And that kind of creativity uh, and quality is going to be available uh, basically to, to everybody. A third example, uh, once again, Dutch. I don't know why. <laughs> the price of uh, orchids in the US decreased by 80% in the last five, six years. Um, greenhouses in Ohio are now producing orchids uh, with Dutch telepresence robotic solutions. Uh, that are overseen directly by operators that are located here in the Netherlands and are implementing reliable production practices that uh, made these orchids uh, available to many, many more people than before because uh, they used to be a luxury item and now their price is comparable to other flowers and people have obviously started buying them uh, in, in enormous numbers. And this type of robotic teleoperation is going to be available everywhere. Um, I don't know if it happened to you, I was very pleased. Uh, I, I, I hate it when people say, uh, yeah, we should uh, do whatever, let's meet. No, I, it's beautiful, I love meeting people, but it's only me, and, and uh, actually I flew in here from uh, Italy uh, this morning, I will fly out tomorrow morning, and, and my schedule is quite hectic. So when somebody says, let's meet in person, my standard answer is, okay, maybe in a couple of months or three. Uh, and so I am getting not too many, but more and more frequently people uh, are, are telling me, okay, we have our uh, remote robot, and you can just um, meet with us in, in the robot body, which is wonderful uh, and uh, spares me a lot, of, uh, a lot of flying time. Health is another example where sensors uh, distributed uh, universally available uh, diagnostic tools that are in our phones more and more practically uh, are empowering people to keep themselves healthy rather than entering the uh, spiral of the health industrial complex that is uh, paradoxically uh, interested in, in keeping a certain level of illness in, in, in the population rather than everybody healthy. Um, 
learning is what you do because of you are you being passionate about a, a subject or or many subjects um, and you can seek out others that are equally passionate as you are rather than education which is what the institutionalized approach does to you and how old and, and how unsustainable our educational practices are today is easily demonstrated by the existence of the summer break, which originally was designed so that the students uh, could go and help the families for the harvest. Now, I don't know. My kids didn't help me with the harvest this summer. <laughs> but I still had to organize so that they would do something while I was, you know, giving talks or doing whatever I do. And as soon as we are able to get out of the cages of our old type of thinking, we will be able to make students love learning rather than concentrating on the problems of education. Because they do. Their curiosity will drive them. Finance is very easily... Um, taken as the exemplar of our problems. Uh, we point fingers and we love it to the banks. Oh my God, 2008 financial crisis and all these Wall Street uh, uh, evil people. Well, finance is just a technology. It is absolutely up to us to use it in a manner that shows that it is not a zero-sum game, that it positively uh, affects the, the, the outcomes. And when we, we can't, it is a failure of not the bankers, it's a failure of society overall in not being able to leverage the power of that particular branch of technology. And we are seeing now new tools that are uh, being adopted by the traditional uh, finance institutions themselves at an increasing and accelerating pace and these tools are all decentralized. If you haven't checked out blockchain technologies, and the symbol up here on the screen is a specific implementation of blockchain technologies called Bitcoin, you should. Forget about the exchange rate, forget about the scandals, forget about the scams. Blockchain technologies are here to stay, and they are going to revolutionize not only how we conduct finance, but how we design trust. In my view, systems like Airbnb, uh, which is distributed, yes, but not yet decentralized, or Uber, which is the same, distributed, yes, but not decentralized, they are just first-generation solutions, do not actually compete with the um, hotel industry uh, or with the transportation lobbies and, 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 and unions of taxi drivers. In my view, those are trust networks that compete with the police industrial complex. Because they let us understand that compliance is better than violating the rules. And most of the people absolutely comply and if you don't, then the network throws you out. Unavoidably, there is no way that you are not going to be caught. Because when I go home and my house is trashed, I know who it was. It was the guy who rented it from Airbnb. There is no need to, to make uh, any, any kind of uh, uh, complex and, and statistically speaking quite uh, fruitless uh, search. The hardest of these eight pillars that I illustrated you is uh, policy making and governance. Um, I, I spoke at the Italian parliament a, a few months ago and I told them, yeah, we have people who shouldn't go close to alcohol. We call them alcoholics. And, and the people doing drugs are addicts. And some accuse them of, of, uh, of, of doing something wrong, but uh, others believe that they are actually uh, exposed for maybe some genetic or, or, or upbringing reasons. And, and, and yes, we have people who are addicted to money and power, and they shouldn't go close to that 
and we call them politicians. <laughs> and yeah, they kind of laughed. Um, but we have alternatives where uh, rather than relying on the scheme that, that we concocted, uh, where Washington would tell Jefferson, hey, listen, I'm going to go to, well, he didn't say I go to Washington, but whatever it was. And uh, four years later, I will come back and you will elect me again. And in the four years, you can trust me that I'm going to do the right thing. Well, this kind of representative democracy was fine when you had to send a, you know, a pigeon to send a letter from one place of the, uh, to the other or, 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 or a pony. Today, in a time of, of uh, uh, instant communications, not only among humans, but in a day of the Internet of Things, a mayor that makes a decision of changing a one-way street in the city, well, he should immediately be able to rely on the data that is gathered by the citizens as they are traveling every day uh, in their cars or public transportation. And that data will tell whether the decision was right or wrong. And then it can be reversed or confirmed. There is no need to wait around. Any uh, legislation that doesn't go through an AI system completely mapping out all the consequences intended, well, there shouldn't be unintended consequences. That is the expression of our stupidity of any piece of legislation that has unintended consequences. It shouldn't be allowable. Now, you can read in the mainstream press about photovoltaics or Bitcoin or, or the sharing economy, and very often you will be convinced by the article that it is just a fad. But if you look at it in context, like you are doing today, I think you will agree that it is actually an unstoppable wave of change. So how is it going to be to be living in a society that is based on these new principles, where the tools of empowerment and the emancipation and the inclusivity are available to everybody? There are between three and three and a half billion people who not only do not have a bank account, they are never going to have a bank account. Can you imagine? Uh, I don't know how many of you tried to open a bank account lately. The KYC, Know Your Customer, AML, Anti-Money Laundering uh, regulations that are shackling banks today are amazing, are incredible. Can you imagine an Ind Indonesian um, fisherman uh, going through those checks? It's, it's, it just cannot happen. But the new systems that finance and technology and communications are making available are going to serve everybody. The only thing needed is a, a smartphone and a desire to learn and desire to experiment. And there are no obstacles. The barriers to entry have disappeared. Uh, the, the birth of, of fab labs and hacker spaces and co-working spaces is exactly the expression of this mutual understanding of permissionless uh, innovation that does not require a central authority giving you the, the label, OK, you are now a licensed innovator. No, there is no such a thing and there shouldn't be because people can share their mistakes and, and, and learn from them. And as they learn on a global basis, they learn also that the varieties of ways of living are, are plentiful and that we can actually understand that these varieties of the ways of living are compatible uh, with each other. We have grown much more tolerant as a society in the past hundred years. And we have to be very careful so that this trend is not reversed. Because uh, we cannot uh, put the clock back and isolate cultures and isolate communications and put up barriers to people, because that is going to be a disaster and it is going to create a conflict that is orders of magnitude harder than not the problems that that kind of separation 
is trying to solve. One of the most important tasks that we have as this transformation, this phase change in society is happening, is to realize that a lot of people will have a hard time to cope. And we cannot blame them. When in the 80s, somebody told you, you know, we are reorganizing the corporation and uh, now you are going to go on a retraining program and we believe that you will be successful and you will be rehired after the program ends uh, in a new position, maybe you believed them. But that kind of message disappeared because Corporations understood that it was better for them looking for profit to churn through people at faster and faster rate. Do you really think as robotic trucks are going to arrive that you can tell the truck driver, well, you have been doing this for 30 years, you are now in your 50s, but uh, we need a lot of web designers. Just retrain, no problem. It is not going to happen. And one of our tasks is to understand what dogmatic assumptions of society have to disappear and become laughable as slavery in the near future in order to give a dignified life to those who unavoidably are going to throw in the towel. And potentially all of you are going to be in that group too, as well as me, or I will be dead. But there will be a point, a threshold, where I will say, wow, um, uh, yeah, uh, you can change your gender every day. <laughs> wow, that's, that's cool. Um, OK, welcome, go ahead. And, and I will say, no, I'm not ready, or whatever. Maybe I will be ready for that, I don't know. And only then we will be able to redesign and restructure communities to be uh, sustainable. Overcoming uh, what has been a, a, a very um, surprising dichotomy. Either, either you had a nonprofit uh, that uh, had to go with a bagging bowl uh, every year to the donors because it did a mountain of good for society or the environment, but actually uh, it was unsustainable financially. Or you had to maximize your profits, uh, otherwise your shareholders would sue you. And you couldn't even think of, of uh, what were the consequences of, of maximizing those profits. And today we have the tools. Uh, in the US they are called benefit corporations, B Corps. Uh, that are for profit, but they are actually uh, in their charter um, looking out not only for their shareholders, but for the wider uh, stakeholders in the environment, in society, uh, and the individuals. And uh, uh, the first country outside of the US uh, last December approved specific legislation for these types of, of, of companies as well, uh, Italy. Uh, very, very interestingly and, and surprisingly. The fact that the transformation is already happening is represented by uh, bureaucracies that are resisting the change. Uh, sometimes uh, based on uh, what is called the precautionary principle. Oh my God, what's going to happen? What if everybody did X, Y, or Z? And of course, any time a minority is accused of not having to do something because what would happen if everybody did that, that is a total uh, excuse get, that you can, you can understand it is, it is not applicable because no change is majority. Every change starts with a minority just wanting to, to do something. Anyway, bureaucracies are in a state of panic. Just like uh, if my immune system uh, uh, sees that I want to eat a nut, uh, if I am allergic, it will say, are you crazy? I will kill you rather than you having a nut. Uh, it is kind of an uh, overblown reaction, right? The same happened uh, uh, two years ago in the state of Hawaii, uh, where the electric utility company 
uh, couldn't absorb uh, the excess power generated by uh, the photovoltaic installations, but they had to be interconnected, so no more solar power. That was the solution. Well, not really. Or um, 500 years ago, Martin Luther uh, dared to translate the Bible, giving access to the sacred text without the intermediation of uh, uh, the, uh, the Catholic Church. 200 years of war followed. And a few years ago, uh, the company 23andMe finally gave us direct access to the secret text of our DNA. Uh, but the Vatican of the FDA said no. You needed the priesthood of uh, the physicians to interpret that text for you because uh, you are too stupid to uh, be allowed to interpret it for yourself. And they are still haggling of what is the right balance uh, between making the information available and making the information actionable. <coughs> New York used to be the financial center of the world. And they decided, ah, it's too hard, let's not. And they took uh, a, a regulation that uh, imposes now compliance costs um, on Bitcoin startups that under some estimates uh, larger than those of banks. And dozen after dozen of startups are not only leaving the state of New York, but actually they are uh, displaying a warning if you go and try to sign up, if your IP is in the state of New York, sorry, we cannot even serve you. And, and that's great. London and Singapore, are, or Hong Kong, sorry, are, are rejoicing. They are saying, you don't want to be the financial center of the world anymore? No problem. But if they understood, as you understand now, that this phase transformation is unstoppable, you would realize that there is no reason for panicking. Yes, things are not uh, clear just because you see a trend. And it's not that having an objective in mind that you will be reaching in a few years uh, lets you understand what is the path to get there. Uh, there are intrinsically uh, difficult or even impossible uh, difficulties in uh, designing very precisely what is going to happen. And a very good demonstration of this difficulty is, of course, uh, when you look at the most successful companies that, as a sign of their overarching success, are included in the Standard and Poor's 500 index of publicly quoted companies. A hundred years ago, this achievement would give you uh, peace of mind, relatively speaking, for over 50 years, over 60 years, actually. Today, the same result uh, is something that lasts little more than a dozen years. This is the concrete statistical proof of the level of unmanageable uh, uh, uncertainty that everybody is exposed to. Everybody regardless of how smart, how powerful, how numerous they are. And you can be the CEO of the largest company when you tell your shareholders at the quarterly meeting that you know what is going to happen. It's theater. It's important, and we all like it, but uh, it, it, there's no difference between him, most of the time, very seldom her, and, and everybody else. But at the same time, uh, trillion dollar companies are being born. Actually, at Singularity University, P Peter Diamandis has a, um, a fireside chat in the evening. Everybody is crazy tired, but we still want to go and, and, and exchange ideas. And, and the talk is, is entitled, Who Wants to Be a Quadrillionaire? Uh, he has an asteroid mining company uh, whose uh, uh, mission is to uh, find and mine uh, high metal content uh, asteroids 
Each of them is uh, estimated to be worth a trillion dollars in terms of metal content. But the real business plan is another, uh, to find high water content asteroids and park them in specific orbits and with solar panels split the water in hydrogen and oxygen and use them as refueling stations for colonizing the solar system. Now these are the mind-bogglingly ambitious ideas that people are concretely working on today. So what we need is a toolbox. We need to understand what we can apply to our problems as they come visible and as we are facing them. And this toolbox allows us to act very fast. Uh, it, it is not a time for a five-year plan like under uh, uh, the Soviet Union or, or still uh, probably somewhat in China or, or other places. It is a time for shrinking or trending to zero between an idea and an action because then you can measure the outcome, course correct, and track towards your goals uh, with uh, intelligence and smarts. And because this is a decentralized world of ideas and practices where teams all over the world work on exciting ideas uh, that they want to bring to the market as fast as possible. That is why I created Network Society Ventures, which invests in all of these pillars that I described to you before. And it does it in a manner that is also walking the walk in a transparent, open, data-driven, algorithmic manner in order to be scalable. And it is a big corporation. We will be accelerating decision-making in uh, global investments in order to catalyze the phase transformation that I was describing. Please read this. <laughs> My my lawyer told me to. <laughs> Just give me a sign when you're done. Fast readers. So, this is the most complex machine ever built. $25 billion to build, uh, euro actually, 25 billion euro uh, to run, not too far, uh, outside of Geneva, is a large Hadron Collider. And the machine is incredible. It uses about 15,000 people to work, uh, and it looks at incredibly exciting data uh, about the workings of the universe. And uh, it generates a lot of data. It is a very smart machine, and it is a somewhat egotistical machine. It's jealous of the data. It looks at the data. It doesn't show humans the data. It actually throws away 99% of the data before any scientist can see it. Because we don't have hard disks that could keep all the data that it generates or any other uh, storage mechanism, it would be impossible to go back to the haystack of data that this machine generates looking for needles and creating bigger and bigger and bigger haystacks that become a problem by themselves. They would be an insurmountable problem as it turns out. So uh, the physicists at CERN creating the Large Hadron Collider understood that they can learn from biology. If biology retained every piece of data we would be swimming in skin flakes. But biology recycles. And so the LHC recycles data as well and only shows you what matters. This is the level of autonomy that machines are going to have and they already sometimes have today. Where humans are in the loop, not one out of a hundred, not out one out of a thousand, if we are lucky, one out of a million decisions are going to be with a human in the loop. Everything else is going to be taken by machines. 
This is how the eye of a Google robotic car sees the road. 360 degrees, scanned at 100,000 times a second, never sleeping, never texting, never drunk. And um, about 2 million kilometers um, have been driven by robotic cars uh, made by Google in California in the past few years. Uh, about a dozen accidents, all of them due to other cars crashing into uh, the robotic car that braked and the human behind didn't brake in time or something like that. And the car, when it is driving, is extremely concentrated on the task. As I said, not distracted by anything doesn't even communicate. But then, uh, close to, Silicon, uh, to, to Singularity University's headquarters in Mountain View, there is a garage. And the cars, when it's night, go back in the garage, huddle together, and during the night, they drive. They dream. And for them, for their brains and their eyes, what is the difference? We believe, you know, we have these Plato cave uh, metaphors uh, where we think that there is a real world and there are the eyes and there are the brains and the interpretation and all the things. They are not worried about that philosophical difference. For them, the senses that are fed uh, simulated data are the same. Virtual reality and augmented reality is not for us, it's for them. And they drive every night, every night, five million kilometers. And they talk to each other, they exchange experiences in order to be a better robotic car the day after. That is the future that is already happening. And there is a war going on. Forget about the wars as we used to recognize them. This is the war. Machines are killing humans every day. The war that we must fight side by side with smart machines is against the dumb machines. The sooner we prohibit dumb machines driven by dumb humans killing one million people per year, the sooner the better. And every month that a politician in a country says, well, I don't know regulations and we have to be careful, every month another 100,000 people die. 50 million people every year are disabled in car accidents at some degree. The cost in economic terms is huge and the cost in terms of human suffering is enormous. This is the war. Dumb machines must lose. An aside, an interesting side effect. A new industry is being born of 3D printed human organs because the source of organs for transplants are disappearing. And those are important for older people, like all of us want to become. And those are young people who die in car accidents. And if young people stop dying in car accidents because cars will be smart, then we need a new source for organs, and we are having. Now, airplanes used to be able to take off, cruise, and land by themselves for the past 20 years. Any airport that used to have fog and there were delays all the time, there is no such a thing anymore because the systems work, radar and whatever else, they communicate. And when you ask, oh, what is the reason we still have pilots in the cockpit? The standard answer is, oh, well, they look over the instruments and of course they are a very important psychological factor for the passengers as well. Until about nine months ago, when a pilot told the plane that it should die and kill everybody crashing against the mountain. 
we must build smart machines that are able to recognize an immoral order and disobey. The plane has to be able to say, go to hell. I'm not going to kill myself. I'm not going to kill everybody uh, on the plane. I don't know. You are crazy. Except that as we were um, sticking sticks in the ground and putting in seeds and uh, building better and better agricultural technology, as we were moving from mud houses to palaces and to skyscrapers, uh, as we were understanding better and better how our body works and, and our uh, digestion and, and uh, every system in the world and the universe, we got stuck and neglected and believed that Bronze Age understanding of what it is to be moral was enough. And that we didn't need to build a science of morality. And here we are now putting an, un, an impossible responsibility on the shoulders of Google engineers who are told, all right, well, you just do the robotic car. Here are the sensors. Here is the traffic code. That's it. But there will be mistakes. There will be decisions that need to be made. The car will have to make life and death decisions. What are the rules under which those life and death decisions are going to be made? Who is going to tell the car what is right or wrong? It will not know it. The programmer doesn't know it. We don't know it because of the 10,000-year-old mistake of not having a science and not having an engineering of morality. It is not yet too late, but almost. We have to hurry up because smart machines are our allies, but smart machines need to be compatible with human morality in order to communicate empathically in order, in order to communicate what our needs, what our emotions, what our desires are in a manner that is compatible with human civilization. We are not better than we were when we were slaves or slave owners. We are not better people. We are deluding ourselves if we think we are. Technology made us better. Technology enabled us to dream ambitious dreams and to realize those dreams in a society around us. It is the superstructure of civilization that gives opportunity to find ourselves better than we thought we could be. And we have to keep exploring what adaptations are going to be needed in order to redefine how it is to be human in the 21st century. What it means to fulfill the potential of our civilization. And that is why we cannot isolate each other. Uh, that is why we have to overcome every possible barrier to interconnect the smarts. We cannot waste a single brain. We don't know Ebola, the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs and the next one may kill us, or an unknown existential threat Who's going to solve it? Is it somebody in Africa, Asia, Australia, South America? Or it must necessarily be somebody in Europe or America? We don't know. And that is why we must care for everybody to build resilient societies that do not break down under the strain uh, of challenges that centralized hierarchical systems cannot sustain. The opportunity we have if we understand that we have and we can ally ourselves with smart machines, exterminate dumb machines whose evolutionary uh, usefulness uh, has ended, is unbounded. And this opportunity is not only in front of a few, but is in front of everybody. There are no barriers to embracing it. Thank you.